Hello and welcome to my project which is called Lock It. The goal of this project was to design a lock system that allowed for smart and connected asset protection. I set out to make this product extremely scalable and also extremely user friendly. In order to make the lock as user friendly as possible, I implemented facial recognition technology and put a companion web application in the background. I believe that in many cases, facial recognition provides a far more pleasant experience than the traditional turn combinational locks. Furthermore, the web application allows users to see when their lock was accessed and to easily control who can access their lock through simply uploading a picture of that person to their account on the web app. In this way, you can give a person access to your lock without actually sharing a password. This is actually very helpful in a lot of situations. For example, say that you are away on vacation and you need your neighbor to do something for you in your garage, which is protected by a key code. Your neighbor asks for the key code over the phone, but you do not feel good about sharing it because it is the same key code that you use for everything. Well, now you don't have to share it. You can simply give your neighbor access remotely and then take that access away at any time in the future. The implementation of this system took on the form of a client-server architecture where the locks are the clients and the server was both a web application and a script to handle connections with the clients running concurrently on my laptop. I used socket programming to implement this architecture. This was similar to Lab 2, but ultimately much more complex as I tried to add in many features such as the ability to handle multiple clients at once. Depicted here is kind of a general layout of the system. Keep in mind there could be more than one lock even though there is only one shown here. So initially the lock sends an unlock request to the server script. The server script then takes this request and shares information back and forth with a web application to determine whether or not to service this request. The server script then sends this decision back to the lock. In order to incorporate facial recognition into my project, I used a Python package aptly named Face Recognition. This package allows you to take in a picture and to extract the useful information about faces in that picture. This information is then stored in a NumPy array and is referred to as a facial encoding. You can then compare two facial encodings to determine whether or not they represent the same person. Both the client and the server side perform facial recognition. The server extracts the facial encodings of the people from the pictures uploaded to the web application. The client extracts the facial encoding from the picture of the person who is currently trying to gain access to the box. The facial encoding extracted from the client is then compared to the facial encodings associated with that lock in the web application to make a decision on whether or not to unlock the lock. However, before the comparison of facial encodings can take place, the client must send its facial encoding over to the server along with some additional information. I structured the client to send a message that first identifies which box it is. The next part of the message is the code that the lock is currently using. In order to unlock the lock, the server will have to send this code back to the client. This is for security purposes, and I will touch on the importance of this later on in the presentation. The last part of the message is the actual facial encoding for the server to use when it's comparing. So in short, the client tells the server something like, hey, I'm box one. If you want me to unlock, send me back one, two, three, four, so I know that it's you. Finally, here is the person who is trying to access the box. The server will then look at that and send something back saying, hey, I see that this person is in your profile on the web app. Go ahead and unlock, one, two, three, four. Or it will say, this person is not one of the people associated with your profile on the web app. Don't unlock. I feel that it's now the appropriate time to show you the demonstration of my system. So here you see the web application associated with the box uh, system. You can log in. So every time someone has issued a new box, they'll be also issued a username and a password that will allow them to log into this web application. And then from this web application, they can uh, update who they would like to be able to have access to the box. So right now you can see I'm the only person that has access to this box, um, but I could add up to seven more people. And then I can also check what times my box has been accessed. So as the super user in the system, I can log in and use my credentials to get to this page here. 
here you see I can add users and I can give them a unique password. Um, and this is how you would add boxes to the system moving forward if you were to scale. So I wanted to give you a little more in-depth look about how the facial encodings are stored within the web application. Um, so you have this subfolder called boxes and then within this subfolder there's another subfolder for each user that has that's within the system. So box one is the user we've been looking into. Um, so log.txt stores the information about the time that the box was accessed at. Um, so every time the box is accessed, uh, a new value is written to this text file, and then these values are pulled when it's serving up the web page uh, for the user to, to display for the user. And then you also have another subfolder, uh, people, and this subfolder has eight text files. And so for each one of the pictures that are uploaded, um, to a user's account uh, for the for the people that have access to the box, they're stored. Uh, it's analyzed, and the information about the facial encoding within that picture is stored in this text file. And so, when a facial encoding comes in from someone who's trying to access the box, what it does is it takes it and it compares it to the facial encodings in these eight text files, and then it uses that to make a decision on whether. The incoming encoding is one of the eight people that's allowed to have access to the box and then it makes a decision based on that and sends something back. I also wanted to point out another security feature used within the web application. Um, so it uses something called password hashing, which so if you look at the user we just signed into, you see that under password uh, there's this weird value stored and what that is is the hash of the actual password and because of the way hashes work, um, you shouldn't be able to go backwards from this value to the password. It's kind of a one-way function by design. And so when you try to sign in, it hashes whatever you're trying to sign in with, and it compares that to the hash of your actual password. And if those two match, then it lets you in. So in this way, you don't actually have to store the, the user's real password in the uh, web server itself, which is really beneficial because if the web server was ever to become compromised, then that could be really problematic. So here you see the infamous box one, which isn't actually in the box because I wanted to show you how it works. Here you see the clients. The client consists of the Pi, which talks to the Arduino via Bluetooth. Um, and then the client, uh, the client is running a script shown uh, on the right here. And then on my computer being run concurrently with the web application is a server script. And so what this does is every time I press this general input output pin, which is one of my sensors, it captures a picture from the, the camera. Uh, and here you'll see no face found because I was not in that last picture. And so now I'll show you when I am in the picture. It captures it and it sends it on over and you see that the lock was activated. So here we have my friend Jalen. Uh, he's going to demonstrate that the lock does not work when it's a different face. Go ahead. And here you see the red light lights up this time. Because of COVID, it's kind of hard to show that you can add people because I don't really have people around to add. Um, however, I'll show you the ability to remove somebody. Now if I demonstrate again, you should see the red light light up and you do. This is because I'm no longer part of the system. My system employs AES symmetric key encryption. For those of you who do not know what this is, it can be explained in the following way. Suppose I want to send you a message. However, I do not want this message to be readable by anyone else, so our goal is to make the me message make no sense for anyone except for us to. Also, assume that you and I know some secret value that anyone in the middle will not know. Additionally, everyone who knows, everyone knows some encryption function, including the man in the middle who's trying to intercept the message. This function has two inputs. The first input is any message. The second input is that secret key that both you and I know, which we will call K. The function might be something like replace every letter in the message with the kth letter from it, from it in the alphabet. So for example, 
If our message was simply just the letter A and the key was one, our message would then just become B. The key is the secret that we both know and the attacker doesn't. So when you receive the message B, you know to shift it down by one to obtain the original message A. The attacker intercepts the message and sees B, but he has no idea what to shift that by to obtain the original message. In this way, we achieve confidentiality. So obviously the actual AES encryption function is much more complicated than just a simple shift, but the idea remains the same. And in this way, even if someone intercepts our message, it really won't make sense to them. Now let's take a look at the system through the eyes of an attacker. How can we potentially exploit the system? We could intercept messages that the server sends back to the client. There is a pretty good chance that this is a message telling it to unlock. Certainly, if you intercepted enough messages, one of them will be telling it to unlock. You could then replay that message back to the client at a later time, which would cause it to unlock. I combated this by creating that four digit code that I was talking about. What I did was I have the client create a one time code before it sends off its message to the server. The server then has to send that code back to the client in order for it to unlock. Additionally, the lock only accepts one message back for every inquiry it sends out to the server. So we as an attacker could intercept the unlock message and replay it back to the lock, but at that point in time, the code required to unlock the lock will be different and the one we have will be no longer valid. Upon reflecting on this more, I did identify a few potential vulnerabilities. As an attacker, if I'm able to intercept the initial client to server message and tell which part of the ciphertext is the code required to unlock the box, then I can send that back to the client before the server can send its decision and always gain access to the box. There's a fairly simple solution to this, and that is to use two symmetric keys. The first key would be used to encrypt and decrypt the initial message from client to this server, and the second key would be used to encrypt and decrypt the decision message from the server to the client. In this way, even if you replayed the ciphertext of the code, it would not get decoded back into the original code on the clients because of the different key being used for decryption, and thus it would not open. I did not implement this in because I did not become aware of it until after I had built the products, but it could be included in the future work pretty easily. I did, however, use what is called an IV, which actually acts as sort of as a of another input to the encryption and decryption function, and I believe that this would help provide some level of protection from the attack I just mentioned. I'm not 100% sure that this attack is entirely possible either. Really, a much more thorough cryptographic analysis would need to be performed on the system before it was ever deployed into the real world, but I believe that I've implemented somewhat of a strong base security mechanism into it. Additionally, the code generated can range anywhere from 1,000 to 9,999, so a brute force attack seems possible. To prevent this, we could potentially implement some sort of mechanism on the client that blocks incoming messages after a certain number of failed attempts. Additionally, recall that I said the client only accepts a message once it has sent, sent one out itself, so the fact that it is not always listening for a response prevent someone from just spamming it constantly with guesses. We could also increase the range of potential codes generated so someone has less of a chance of guessing it on any given try. Lastly, not all random number generators are suitable for cryptographic use. I just used a simple random number generator in Python and this could be upgraded to one that is more secure in the future. For software, I primarily use Python because it's what I'm most comfortable with. Within Python, I use socket programming, the face recognition package I mentioned earlier, and a web application development framework called Django. I use Django because it was something that I was familiar with and because it makes it really easy to implement re many really nice features such as the admin page I showed you. I also use the Raspberry Pi GPIO package to enable my system to be able to realize a button push. The Pi camera also had a Python package associated with it. The camera and the button are two examples of sensors in my system. Obviously, the servo representing the physical rotational lock is an actuator along with the other two LEDs that help give feedback to the user about where the system is at internally. The software in the system obviously had a speed constraint as you did not want to keep the box owner waiting for too long after they pressed the button, especially as a strong user experience was one of my main goals. My system met this constraint pretty well as the video demonstrated. Initially, I wanted to use a solenoid lock for my project. However, hardware constraints prevented me from doing so as that type of lock typically required a huge amount of current. 
In the real system, the physical hardware would have to be much more durable, but for my prototype, all of the constraints were pretty much met. Additionally, the hardware used to implement the button was very responsive and was not a detriment to the overall user experience, which again was really important to me. In the first iteration of my project, I used a wired serial connection to connect the Raspberry Pi to the Arduino. However, because the project required that this be a wireless connection, I then switched to Bluetooth. I just thought this wired serial connection would be more secure. However, the code for both iterations is included in the final project submission. On the server side, which is my laptop, I was running Windows 10. And on the client side, which was the Raspberry Pi, I was running Raspberry Pi OS. Raspberry Pi OS was actually better for their facial recognition module, but after playing around with it, I got it to work on Windows 10 as well. I started out by first familiarizing myself with the facial recognition Python package. I then built up the Raspberry Pi button and camera. From there, I laid out the groundwork for the web application. All of this pretty much served as the foundation of the project. Moving forward, I educated myself on how to do socket programming. Once I felt comfortable with that, I worked to implement all of the functionality on the client side and then all of the functionality on the server side, specifically as it pertained to the facial recognition. Lastly, I put my new socket programming knowledge to use and I got them to work together. Moving forward, there are a few different things you could do. First, you could continue to make it more secure as we talked about. Second, you can make it more robust. On rare occasion, there was an error in communicating the large message with the facial encoding attached, and this caused you to have to restart the server to reconnect the client. Again, this did not happen very often, but it either should not happen at all, or if it does, the system should be better equipped to handle the error so it does not require a total reset. Lastly, I reinforce again that this is a locked system that is meant to be able to handle numerous clients connected to it. It can be used for asset protection, but it can also be used by companies like the CTA or the Kibby Bikes. The idea is that you would have to be able to have the ability to pay with your face for something like a train ticket or rent a bike with your face. The face recognition is not perfect, and even though this technology will continue to get better, this should be addressed. So for example, one of the problems is that the facial recognition model can misidentify people as being the same even when they're not. This would likely be a problem for an application like the CTA because the high number of users it's comparing the incoming encoding against would likely produce more than one match and thus might charge the wrong person money. Because of this, you could implement some sort of second check. You could, for instance, require that the systems users have a companion app on their phone that checks the, their location and therefore someone must be located at the CTA station node and also be recognized by the facial recognition for their account to be charged. Furthermore, a system like this where you com are comparing the incoming encoding against everyone with the CTA account versus only up to eight people like in our system would require a ton more computational power. Ultimately, I tried to develop a system that could serve as the base or inspiration for other larger systems that could be implemented in unique and creative ways. Thank you, and are there any questions?